So thank you again um, for inviting me to talk to you just about functional limitations um, in a workplace. Um, I want this to be kind of more informal than anything else, but um, just kind of chat with you about some of the, the key things that I've seen over the last few years, um, onboarding new counselors and also just, um, hold on just a second, I think I lost you. <laughs> we can see you. We can yeah, see you. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah I, I, I got too many screens up. So okay. <laughs> <laughs> let's see. I'm just going to share the screen and just keep it moving yeah, since we are time sensitive here. So I know this is not the way to do this, but we're going to do it anyway. All right. I'll drop this into chat and just so that you'll have the, um, the uh, screen slides for you. All right, so you should be seeing that screen. All right, so let's let's kind of start about start it all over. So um, thank you again, Dr. Zahn, Dr. Cross, Miss um, um, Chairman, for um, actually inviting me to come and talk to talk to you guys about just functional limitations in the workplace. Um, again, just kind of looking at um, an informal discussion about things that I've seen as a manager, as a rehab counselor in the field for over you know, over 27 years, just key things that um, as you're preparing new counselors, you want to kind of keep in mind um, and give them that extra edge when they do get into the field and be able to step into the field on that. Uh, so our, my agenda is pretty quick, really easy. Um, I'm going to kind of give you a little bit about my background. I have one objective and a one objective only, <laughs> you know, this is a short period. Just want to get the nugget of information out there. Um, talk about a little bit about the, the importance of defining the functional limitations and then also just some FYIs for new professionals who are entering the field that you can share um, with new counselors who are onboarding or as you're preparing them and help myself as a manager who is out here uh, working with counselors and working with the professional um, as they come on board, helping us kind of complement and educate them and get them ready to really assist a client, a person with disabilities in uh, their job search and other employment opportunities. And depending on the time, um, I'll throw in a brief example, but I may not have the time on it, but we'll see what, where we're at on the time on that. And just kind of just open it up for some questions if you may have some. So background about me real quick. Um, both my undergraduate degrees and graduate degrees are both in rehabilitation counseling. Um, probably about, I calculated it the other day, about 27 years of experience in various areas. Um, 19 of my years so far have been with Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, definitely uh, been uh, in various roles in that capacity, um, from service delivery as a counselor to more uh, national training supervisor, to a training specialist, to HR, you name it, I've done it in the last 19 years, but two years ago, I decided to get back to the service delivery piece. Um, leadership roles are mostly in, um, is, is, I've been in mostly leadership roles and probably in the last 15, I think I calculated 15 to 16 years has been in a management role. So um, just kind of some of the things I've seen as I onboarded counselors, but also some things that um, just some some pitfalls, some things that they struggled with when they came on board um, in either at the VA or state rehab or in a mental health setting. So, you know, we, we kind of cross a lot of different areas in this profession. Uh, so five years mental health, three years in state rehab. And then right now I'm currently, like I mentioned, uh, more re recovery focused clinical rehab. Uh, so kind of went back in. Um, kind of revisited my years in mental health, uh, coming back over to the VHA side to gain some more insight in that area. Um, so really, I just supervised 16 uh, counselors on my side of house direct reports um, and providing services, uh, vocational rehab services under the mental health center here in Houston, Texas. So I always have to put the disclaimer on there. Yes, I work for the VA, but I'm not really speaking on the bad, but I am still representing the organization because I'm here. <laughs> so a lot of this is my thoughts what I've experienced and conversations I've had with my colleagues across um, across the agency and even the state and local um, people uh, that I've talked to. 
my objective is really quick, just to gain some insight. Uh, just some thing, key things you may want to think about when you're as you're preparing rehabilitation counselors. It may not be new, but it may if it gets you to think about, aha, I might want to emphasize that in that area. I, I've done my job, um, so you know that's really quick, easy, and ways that I want to kind of approach this with you guys. So, kind of taking a look at the definition of functional limitations. Um, I think one of the things that I've um, I've noticed as new counselors have come on board is really understanding the definition. Now, this definition is really from CDC, but I mean, there's other functional limitations, some other things and uh, that you can pull from it. But just having to make sure they understand the whole uh, just of what a functional limitation is, how it's defined. And, um, and those six core functional domains and making sure they understand what those six core functional domains are. You know, they're gonna experience that with any client. Well, they're gonna experience that with clients that there are, they are um, providing services to. And it can be more in the mobility area, more than likely. But I mean, there's also communication, there's cognition and, you know, cognitive, you know, kind of things that they'll see more of self-care, seeing and hearing. So if they have a good gist of understanding of what those uh, six core areas and what it entails by the six core areas, then um, they're already one step ahead as far as when they come on board um, to a rehab counseling professional uh, position, either no matter where they're at across the profession, um, it just helps me as a manager and as um, a leader in order to complement what you've already trained and been able to provide that as that foundational piece. Um, so, you know, and we already know too that it is really, we see that in functional limitations as a general, and this is just, just you know, we know this, but, you know, it does impact and um, influence a lot of the things as it relates to educational attainment, employment, and other daily activities. Here in what I do in a clinical kind of setting, we hit on all three of those, mainly more for employment and daily activities more than anything else. Since and we're in a clinical uh, rehab um, setting here at the hospital, but you know, in other areas, you know, you bring in that educational attainment too, and so all of that influence. You know, one of the things for functional limitations that a new professional really needs to have a good foundational understanding on, and if they have that, you know, they're like I said before, they're one step ahead. They're one step ahead of the game for a lot of different things. So the areas that I kind of have seen of just what new rehabilitation counselors or professionals should know about functional limitations and how it all kind of plays in together. First of all, is why does it matter? You know, one of the things that um, I'm sure, you know, we all got in this profession for a reason. We all here to, you know, provide supports and assistance to persons with disabilities in order to overcome the barriers, you know, achieve employment. In some, in some cases, is even to daily activities of, of living and there are other things, but mainly for overcoming the barriers to employment. And so, you know, we are here to strive, you know, to make sure that they bring their whole self to the work. You know, uh, we don't want to limit them um, we want to make sure that we are able to identify those limitations, but really focus on the strengths. And I'll mention that later on in another part of the slide deck. But, you know, bring their whole self to work, their true identity, who they are, and wanting to make sure that they can contribute and collaborate and, um, to the work environment that they have. And they can't do that if they're not bringing their true self and their um, whole self to the work environment, just like with ourselves. We want to make sure we bring that and we give that opportunity to do that. Same with a person with disabilities. We'll make sure that they have this, the things that they need to do as a rehabilitation counselor, helping them bring that whole self to work. Um, we're there as their advocate. You know, I mean, it's really simple and plain. I, I hate to kind of repeat it, but I think I always set that foundation for new counselors when they come on board. You know, why are you here? Why are we here? What is our function? What is our role here? as rehabilitation counselors and as we're supporting um, persons with disabilities or clients um, with obtaining educational goals or obtaining occupational goals and just making sure we're there as an advocate for them and making sure they have that sense. Like I said, we didn't get into this profession uh, just, just as a, a fluke. You know, we chose this profession. 
And we want to make sure that we provide that, those um, skill sets and those things for them. But also self-advocacy, you know, um, we have to be able to teach them themselves how to be a self-advocate, you know, for themselves and what their needs are. And, and as a rehabilitation counselor, as a professional, we owe it to them in order to provide them with those, that information and those tools. And so I always had that conversation with new counselors as they're coming on board, um, whether it was in my current role right now with doing that, but even when I was a national training supervisor on another position, as new counselors came on board, I wanted to make sure I had that conversation with why they were there. And just making sure they re reemphasize that. So as you're preparing them for entering the field of rehabilitation counseling, um, just reemphasizing, which I know you do, but um, just let them know that we're going to reemphasize it again when they get into an actual occupation again. Because every setting is a little bit different, so we just want to make sure we hone in on that. But those are the core things. Try to bring their whole self to work, uh, make sure they are true identity, and just being an advocate and teaching them how to be an advocate. Now, one of the things that um, I said obvious versus hidden disabilities, and um, when talking to some of my new counselors who have come on board in the last year, um, but also some seasoned counselors, uh, about certain things that they wish they would have known when they got into the field. Um, is more not so much the physical disabilities and that some of the things that you can obviously see and how I do be able to identify those functional limitations, but it's those, um, those hidden disabilities, those other ones, they struggle with mental health uh, mm -hmm. as one of those conditions, um, one of those disabilities um, of identifying those functional limitations, how to um, work with the client in those areas and really focus on the strings after they identify those limitations, but working on the strings and being able to communicate that either to an employer that is a potential employer, but also um, some people um, if they are trying to help them maintain a job. And so making sure that they are able to understand that in the mental health sense. Um, for example, here, uh, like I said, I'm in clinical rehabilitation. So, you know, I know we're getting pretty much we're getting better at it because I know there are some clinical rehab programs out there that kind of emphasize this area. Uh, and I know there's some dual programs, but if there's a dual program that's not necessarily a clinical piece, um, taking a look at that mental health part and really understanding that because we're seeing an influx of, of clients um, definitely in, in mental health conditions and disabilities and challenges that they have been going through. Um, and able to get them back to work or overcome some other barriers to employment. So um, really focusing on those areas as it relates to mental health. Substance abuse is another one. Uh, substance abuse is another challenging one. A lot of times that I have seen uh, new rehabilitation professionals come on board with, and they struggle a little bit with that area. Now, of course, as they continue in their profession, they'll get better with it. Uh, they'll 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 pick up the skill sets and grow into the field, but they the anxiety when they come into it and some of the things that um, they they um, are challenged with when they come into the field, you know, if they had those foundational pieces, it's a little bit easier. Uh, just because, as as I mentioned before, I have sixteen direct reports. As a manager, sometimes I'm not able to really do the one on one handouts well. So, um, and I'm probably not alone with a lot of different managers in the rehabilitation field. So if they have those foundational things, we can have that conversation. I can assist them with overcoming or addressing whatever limitations and giving them the tools and resources in order to support them to continue to move forward and really assist the client um, with employment opportunities and or maintaining employment. Disclosure. The no brainer um, that, that that's a big one for a lot of different things. Um, and that's sometimes has been a challenge for a lot of different counselors that I've noticed. Uh, just being comfortable with um, understanding when to disclose, because sometimes it's it's necessary to disclose depending on the circumstances um, of how you're working with the client, whether it's a potential job. Um, contact um, or even maintaining the job, but just how to do that. Because that fear of discrimination, unconscious bias, um, just those negative consequences when it comes to when you disclose 
that's still always there. And they're always there anxiety provoking for not only the client, but also the counselor. So if that counselor can be comfortable and be able to explain that and really have that confidence when they're trying to talk to their veteran, not veteran, excuse me, client. And if I slip up, say veteran, that's the reason why. But client, <laughs> in order to overcome and how to advocate for themselves also, um, if they're comfortable with it, they'll be able to um, assist that uh, client with order to uh, figure out when is the proper way to disclose. So it's not just stressful for the, the client, but also for the counselors and just getting that comfortable, build, I mean, being comfortable able to do that. Um, I threw this in here, but I was trying to find an actual report and I apologize for that. <laughs> so I usually don't do that. I usually like to cite something, but, um, but you know, in, and even nowadays, this actual report, and it was by Accenture, was, did the report for it. But even now, even 76% even is hard, uh, is a high number when it comes to employees that really don't fully disclose this disability at work. And that's because of those negative consequences and that stress and anxiety and being and knowing when they need to disclose. And sometimes you have to disclose if you need that reasonable accommodation. And so you want to make sure that that um, takes place on um, in order for them in order to do their job and be successful in their job. And as you know, if they disclose, they're able to be their true self, they're able to bring their whole self to the work environment, they're going to be more engaged uh, when they're able to do some things like that. But it is a science and just communication and being able to network and understand how to communicate that to an employer and how a uh, client needs to communicate to the employer. So one of those anxiety provoking things that most new counselors kind of feel out about. Legal rights, I just, I will quickly kind of go through that. My experience over the last 20 some years and being in management, I seem to be the subject matter expert. <laughs> HR can tell you a lot about uh, the laws and everything, the protection and everything about uh, as it relates to reasonable accommodations, but they really rely on the rehab professional too. Um, especially if their counselor is there to think outside the box of what those um, accommodations are, because it's not always, and we hear that in the pro, um, as you're going through your training and everything, um, it doesn't have to be very costly to do those accommodations. But, you know, being comfortable to think outside the box, work with the employee, with the employer, the HR professional, because they're going to be relying on you to do that, um, to provide that other feedback, because Otherwise, they're going to go to the one thing, the fault one of undue hardship yes. to the organization, and they can't really provide an accommodation. And we know that's not necessarily always true. We can think of some things, you know, as we are professionals. So being able to uh, make sure that the, the uh, counselor is able to really grasp the reasonable accommodations and really understand about the how they can participate in the application process, but also the fu essential functions of the job mm -hmm. and how that all plays in part, because that's going to be what the HR person, whether it's an employer or maintaining the job, that's what they're looking at, the job restructure, reassignment, um, and just really what can we do in order to um, make it uh, appropriate environment, work environment for them to be successful. Um, We'll just also just emphasize to, again, that they're the disability professional and don't get intimidated, <laughs> you know, and I think a lot of new counselors, when they come out, they, of course, they're like, oh, um, they're new to the profession. They may not know, but they know more than what they, they think they know, too. You know, they, they are the rehab professional. They've gone through the training that um, you as rehab educators have provided for them and that we're complimenting when they get on site in the work site, they are the disability professional and they should own it and treat that identity as either as a CRC, CVE, whatever, own it and be that disability professional. And then other legal rights. Um, so I know it's all in the programs for training for a lot of different people, you know, just having that forum understanding those foundational working knowledge of the various legal um, legal law, the legal rights, but the laws out there that kind of um, impact employment for persons with disabilities, but just everything in general. We, I put the American Disabilities Act Amendments Act of 2008, 
because that's kind of one of the recent ones. But, um, you know, all of the, the amendments for the Rehab Act, um, focusing on the Section 501, 504 areas, so they have a working knowledge. They don't have to be experts, you know, coming on, but at least have that the ability to explain it to maybe to employers who don't know, but also be able to educate. Because remember, we're supposed to be self-educating the client to be self-advocates for themselves, too. And having that comfortability to be able to explain that to them um, of those key things in some of those acts uh, and some of those laws um, that are important for them. Um, we we owe, um, is another one I know that doesn't, depending on where they go into the rehab field, it may not impact. But um, having a firm understanding of that one, too. And I threw the veterans one on there just because I work in the veterans affairs. But, uh, but you know, it kind of with federal federal uh, contracts and things like that for different employers. And so we know also that a lot of times that persons with disabilities may not disclose. And in our case, a lot of times veterans don't disclose that they're a veteran. So just knowing which law applies. Um, the different factors and whether employers in public or private sectors are impacted by that and be able to explain that to them. I'm going to run out of time, so I won't do the example for hidden disability, but the one that I have seen the most on is um, physical uh, ones for migraines, and it had been a challenge. And I just had a, a, a uh, staff member um, that I had to work with and, and help them identify what those reasonable accommodations or how to communicate for themselves about the physical, um, the limitations on the physical migraines. And then also helping HR, again, understand the full parameter of what their limitations or what their strengths are and trying to identify that other occupation within um, the job, within the agency, in order so they can continue to serve veterans and serve uh, 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 veterans and just people, persons with disabilities in another capacity if it wasn't for the capacity that they work in. So that was one of the things on that. Um, so sorry about we didn't ran, ran out of time on that one. But that's the gist of a lot of the things. The um, Just want to make sure that I just hit on a couple of things and just say that, you know, counselors just need to know that they are the professionals. They are um, knowledgeable, be comfortable with who they are and the training that you've provided as educators and that they're going to get additional um, supports as they get on the job. But if they come in with those key, some of those key things that I've seen them struggle with um, in the profession, um, they should be able to um, get off the ground running and be able to provide that support. And that's just not new counselors. I've seen seasoned counselors. We kind of get complacent sometimes and we need to revisit, <laughs> so, uh, but they can help us revisit because they're bringing in new thoughts, new ideas about the profession that they're gaining from you. So that's really quick. I know that was quick, uh, but I uh, wanted to just kind of open it up, see if there's any questions and see if there's anything else that I can provide for you. Thank you so much, Mr. Gladney. I um, failed to mention that Mr. Gladney is um, a member of our education committee. And so we're super excited, you know, um, that you were here, you shared your time and your expertise. And so I'll just um, allow now an opportunity, a few moments for questions or comments, if anybody has any. comments? Well, I'd like to make a comment. I was super excited. <laughs> I was super excited about your presentation because I'm a former rehab educator and um, one who's taught medical and psychosocial aspects of disability. So um, understanding or knowing that you know, students have to understand functional limitations in this way. So understanding functional limitations to the extent that they know, you know, exactly what's going on in terms of the disability and how those functional limitations impede or contribute to the impediment of employment. And knowing that you guys in the field are, you know, making sure that students, because educators are, you know, talking about 
um, functional limitations from the theoretical perspective and those of us with you know practical experience you kind of bring you know that stuff in but students don't really believe it until they hear it from you it's so know yeah, it, right, from us you know, right so knowing that you know you guys are actually talking about that in the field you know helping to facilitate their level of understanding practically I was super excited so thank you so much for your expertise in this area. Oh, no problem. And I, I appreciate that. You know, I am committed to the rehabilitation counseling field, regardless of what I, wherever I land. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, it just, you know, the history of just being training new counselors and new professionals as they enter the field. Um, there's a wide variety of things that we can do as we have, uh, we have professionals. And I just want to make sure they understand that yeah. and they know what's out there and, you know, and uh, push, you know, CRCC, you know, their certification, you know, as a, as a uh, big uh, contributor, but also CBE. I know I have a couple of my staff members I'm pushing to get that. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's there and we need to um, uh, definitely take ownership and take over our and, and really promote our identity, our professional Absolutely. identity. Absolutely. You know, Thank you again. Yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. I want to give... Um, an opportunity for anybody like one final time to either ask a question or comment if you have any. Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Oprah Everett, Fort Valley State University, uh, Clinical Rehab Counseling. Um, I, I appreciate it, Reginald. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, I, I kind of reiterate what Susan was saying. I teach a class and uh, trying to get students to really understand what functional limitations are has really been a challenge. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, we're, we're, we're great at identifying the disability, yeah. but not really understand how that disability impacts the person's life or the ability to work uh, has been a challenge, even though sometimes I give them a you little know, cheat sheet. Sometimes uh, I'm having this to take a few minutes and really un help them understand. And so I think it's still a challenge, but I think once they start to embrace it and see it uh, face to face, I think it becomes a better situation for them. But uh, I think it was a really good presentation, and I, I thank you for your expertise. Yeah. Well, no, thank you. Um, yeah, and we we do um, as employers. You know, I know I, I can only speak for myself, uh, <laughs> and I know my colleague on the VBA side of the house. You know, we we do take that very seriously in trying to provide that additional support and supplemental education when they come on board. Um, they're not going to know everything, but we're going to make sure that we provide that support for them as much as possible, so they they can be successful and grow in the profession. Thanks so much. Thanks for the comment, Dr. Everett. Anyone else? I would just like to uh, again thank Reginald. Earlier, I, I added doctor to your <laughs> to your title. Oh, not yet, not yet, almost. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm still uh, um, look at her right. It will be by the spring. <laughs> but I want to thank you for it. Was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. And again, thank you to each of you who took time out of your schedule today to join this uh, webinar that uh, Kenyatta and the education team put on. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you again. So, you. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, I was just say thank you again. And, and remember, VA has where we have counselors on both the VHA side and VBA side. And we are always looking for, you know, new talent and new um, people out there. So I like to throw that out there real quick. <laughs> thank, you. thank you all so much. So um, this ends today's webinar, but we would like for you to join us next month where we'll have Dr. Wilson, Dr. Keith Wilson, who's professor program chair and director of the graduate studies and counselor education at the University of Kentucky. This topic will be understanding how to apply cultural competence in practice. So thank you again for attending today and we look forward to seeing you on next month. Thank you again, Mr. Gladney, we appreciate you.